Good evening. Please help me welcome to the stage one of the founding members of the Psychedelic Rangers, Mr. Robbie Krieger. And, I'm sorry, what? I can't, I can't hear you. Okay, that's better. And of course, you know this next gentleman as one of the award-winning mem members of the Santa Monica Community College Marching Band of 1964, Mr. Don John Densmore. Oh, and by the way, they were also in the doors. Um, let me start with, with you, John, because I always think of that great line whenever I hear... Elvis? Uh, I'd like to say something before you grill us. Well, I'll season you while you talk, so go ahead. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, it, it was 80 years ago today that uh, prohibition was uh, stopped. <laughs> and so I'm going to toast two folks, Nelson Mandela <laughs> and Ray taught me this. He said that uh, ancient Egyptian culture always said that if you really wanted to remember someone's name, you say it. So I have three words for you. Raymond Daniel Manzarek. <laughs> I got three more for you. James Douglas Morrison. Hey! hey. Yo! You know what? It's, uh, it's Jim's uh, birthday is uh, December 8th, so we tried to have this on December 8th, but this was as close as we could get, so this is uh, for Jim's birthday. Absolutely. Well, we're out of time. Good night, everybody. Listen, one of the things I noticed from watching this movie, and you mentioned in the book, John, is that The Doors were one of the first bands to use billboards. And just seeing that, I mean, that was such a break from what people had done before, wasn't it? Just the idea of not having junk or Earl Scheib or tires advertised, but an announcement of a band. Um, is Jack Holzman out there? No, he's the he one who thought of having... Uh, instead of advertising deodorant, yeah. a billboard. And I remember we were there for a photo shoot, and, and the interviewer from the Times said, why are you doing this? You can't hear a billboard. What, what, what's up? It started well, That was kind trend. of fun. We, we actually climbed up on the billboard. It was like 30 feet high, and uh, they took some pretty good shots of us. It's pretty great. Now, uh, when it said in the, in the movie that you guys are a fusion band, I was thinking, again, something you said in the book, John, which just really stuck with me. Every time I hear a Doors record, in fact, I think of it, the grandfather drum, the grandfather beat, and how there's something almost kind of primal about the way the drums play in that kind of way that goes back, not only to, to the Native Americans, but also the way it invokes jazz as well. Are you saying I'm old, Elvis? I'm quoting you from your book, John. <laughs> the grandfather is the, the pulse, you know. It, we, we hear it in the womb. It's our mom. And then we're why in there. They, so why we... do they call it the grandfather? <laughs> Should be the mom. <laughs> Same. 
Same deal. So if you don't have that pocket, all the flashy stuff on top doesn't really mean much, you know. It, it's, it, you know, that's what makes everybody dance, is if it's really tight, that grandfather. Yeah, and if you ever watch Jim uh, dance around the stage, he, he really was like an American Indian. You know, it was very, uh, prime. he knew nothing about dancing, believe me. I mean, <laughs> he's possibly the worst dancer you've ever yes, seen. Yes, black people know that Jim was a very <laughs> bad dancer. But, you know, anybody can do that kind of Indian thing, man. It's like. Well, yeah, you know, Mick, Mick Jagger kind of uh, copped uh, James Brown for a little while, didn't he? Well, he thought he did. But anyway. Ah. Um, ah. But just getting back to this whole fusion thing, too. I mean, Robbie, I just always love that sort of combination of flamenco and bottleneck blues. I mean, that's something that I think was being so unique to you. How did that style come to you? Well, I played flamenco before I. You know, that was the first kind of guitar I played, so uh, it was kind of uh, natural. You know, I, I, I wanted to get it into, the, into our music somehow, and I was able to do it on one song, but I mean, I, I think the way, the way I played flamenco with the right hand uh, it was a lot different than most people. Electric guitars are usually with a pick, and I, I didn't use a pick because of the flamenco training, so I think that made me sound different. It gives it a much softer, much more intimate sound, just that finger strumming on the electric guitar. Yeah, sure. And, and you know, a lot of other people are doing it. I mean, Jeff Beck doesn't use a pick anymore, you know? So uh, in my book, I described you as a, a crab crawling across the strings. And it was fascinating to watch. And that's what Jim was so fascinated with. Of course, in Miami, they thought it was something else, but... <laughs> yeah, they, they, uh, they accused him of uh, performing fellatio on me while I was... He says, I was just watching his fingers, it? you know? And he, he was, I mean, he was kind of on his knees down there. I was playing. And... I have no response to that. What I'll ask you instead <laughs> is just... You talking about the the way you play it, and then I hear like a kind of a Morricone influence too on some of the stuff on L.A. Woman. That sort of this talk of Clint Eastwood, but that spaghetti western. And you weren't doing it in an ironic way when you were playing it. You were really feeling it. And I just thought that's one of the things that made that the song sound so. I said cinematic before, but they really feel like movie songs. Yeah, I always loved a movie soundtrack. I mean, westerns kind of, uh, you know. Um, I, you know, I didn't consciously try to make it sound that way, but I'm sure that was in there. But you can hear, I mean, it even goes back to, I mean, a little bit of like Rawhide, or as it said in the movie, Ghost Riders in the Sky. But again, the way that the fullness of, of, of Morricone and those, those spaghetti westerns is very much a part of that. And again, that feels to me like that combination of flamenco, but also a little bit of Jimmy Reed in there too, isn't there? Oh yeah, I lo love Jimmy Reed uh, and all the old blues guys, you know. That was uh, definitely uh, what I was listening to, other than flamenco, uh, before the doors. Because, again, I say fusion band because I know, obviously, for you, Ray, besides the grandfather sound, I told you when I was growing up in Detroit, there was a great jazz station, and Elvin Jones talked about the two drummers that he loved, and one was Keith Moon, and the other was you, just because of the way you never, you stayed on top of it, it never got away from you. Uh, yeah, I, I'd never heard that until today when you told me. Elvin Jones said he loved John? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. that cool? Son of a bitch. <laughs> so, uh, uh, briefly, I, I saw Coltrane many times as a kid, and Elvin was my idol. And uh, in my book, Riders on the Storm, I wrote that he gave me my hands, and then I gave him the book, and thank God he was really gracious. And then I went to see him after Coltrane died, and I would help, help him take his drums to the car, and he was my mentor. And today I heard that he liked my playing. Ah, thank you. Oh, no, sure. That's cool. Because <laughs> you also talk about in the book, when Coltrane played, he went into a trance. And I felt like there was that kind of thing happening for you guys almost. The music feels meditative in a way that you kind of 
kind of floated out on top of the grooves a little bit. Is that is that right? I mean, because it felt like very trance-like music in some ways. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I think part of a lot of that was from Ray's bass playing, which he played with his left hand. So, in order to play with his left hand, he had to kind of put it on automatic pilot. You know, and so it would be it would be very trance-like. You know, very uh, hypnotic. Uh, just doing the kind of same thing over and over, which most ba bass players, uh, and I'm sure there are a few here today, are, they would get bored in two seconds doing that, you know. But yeah. but Ray was, uh, you know, that was, and I think that's the reason we never did get a bass player is because we every time we try a bass player, we would miss that. And Ray said that it came from Boogie Woogie, yeah. <laughs> and he tells a sweet story about how. His left hand was kind of dumb and just played this repetitive dum 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 dum. And then his right hand took off, you know. And, and think about this guy, like drummers sort of split their minds and have each limb do something different. And he sort of split his mind into the bass and this incredible Bach like blues organ. Incredible. Yeah, but, but the bass was, uh, was the automatic one, right. you know. Yeah, so it's like two halves of your mind. You know, yeah. there's this, the, uh, what is it, it's the left brain, what does that do? <clears throat> well, uh, if I'm left-handed, if you're left-handed, you're in your right mind. <laughs> but up, <laughs> So you are in your right mind, two, three, four. Um, you talk about in the book, too, you talk about bass players. At one point, you guys were looking at a girl bass player or something like that? Uh, sh uh, we had a, well, you guys had a, ba a girl bass player that played on the original demo. Yeah, before. What was her name? Uh, oh, God. Uh, I don't know. Huh? Right? But it was Somebody before the Go-Go's. Somebody must know. Patty what? Patty Sullivan. Wow. Sullivan. Patty Sullivan. The Patty Sullivan. Yeah, it was not Carol Kay, as she claims. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Is that Carol leaving now? Okay. <laughs> but yeah, the, the legendary Patty Sullivan. Because I was wondering, would we get to see the bass player come in for this. I mean, it's a, it, and also having a rhythm guitar, so that really changed the sound. Was that something you guys just felt like it was just the right time to do, I mean, in production? Well, it, it, we, even from the first record, we had, uh, I think, Larry Nechtel, the late great bass, studio bass player, duplicate Ray's lines because there was no Moog synthesizer, so uh, the keyboard bass was too mushy, and, and the string of a Fender bass gave it the pluck and punch we needed. That was on a couple of songs, but some of the songs just had Ray's uh, bass. Some, like, uh, some. Yeah, Break On Through, for instance, was just uh, keyboard bass. Uh, yeah. what, what other one? Got uh, me. Unhappy Girl. Yep. Happy Girl. And, but, you know, and we, a, little, a little known fact is that I actually overdubbed the bass on two songs on the album, first album. It's a quiz. Anybody know which ones? Not Patty Sullivan. <laughs> Backdoor Man and... Oh, that's right. It's coming and, back. And, and what was the other one? Um, Soul Kitchen. Soul Kitchen. Soul Kitchen, of course. Oh, my God. You knew that. Yeah, because well, first of all, I, mean, I can't think of you and not think of blues stuff. I mean, I know the flamenco is, but you have such a delicate way of playing the blues that it can't help but bring to mind Jimmy Reed. And you talk about percussive. The Doors, to me, seems like finally it's always a percussive band. I mean, there's that bossa nova, there's flamenco, there's the jazz rhythms. And it's one of these things that I think that's why for every generation, the band means something else because of the musical complexity. And you must hear this all the time. Yeah, I mean, I... I it's the drumming, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, we all went to college, so we were, we were a little further ahead than most bands. <laughs> Although none of us took music in, in school. That's the amazing thing. But know, he, was in the marching think, band in Santa Mon he was in the marching band in Santa Monica College. Oh, that's true, but, but none of us actually went to a music school, which I think might have been a good thing because, you know, I th you know as much as I think it's great for kids to go to music school, I think that sometimes they get to in into the technical thing uh, and uh, you know the l right brain doesn't get a chance to uh, express itself. I think also too besides that you guys come from so many different kinds of influences you couldn't get those in music school. There would be a pretty sort of rigid set kind of training and I can't imagine somebody doing 
flamenco and blues guitar playing or somebody using, you know, listening to Indian percussion players and also using well, jazz? Well, maybe nowadays they, they would, but not back then, not back then. I actually, I have to change that. I actually did take music course in, uh, at UCLA. What did you study? I studied Indian music, Indian music. And I dated the uh, teacher. She was a beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you so, mean was this before or after uh, Ravi Shankar's Canara School? No, this was at UCLA before yeah. the Doors. Oh, oh, okay. John, so John and I went to the uh, Ravi Shankar School. Uh, when was that? About Sixty sixty-eight. Five. No, it was later. It was after the Doors were together. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, later. Yeah, then we had the money to go. Yeah, yeah, right. right, right. <laughs> So I know you mentioned in the book seeing the uh, Shankars and, and, and the, uh, all that percussion and just really drinking that in. That's tabla talk I learned at Ravi Shankar school. Yeah, each note has a, a, a sound, a vocal sound, right? And you have to sing it before you learn to play it. The most difficult drumming in the world. But again, it's, it's what I'm talking about. It's that, that layer of musical complexity. Just talking to somebody backstage about this. Um, because having grown up in the Midwest, the doors had a different kind of impact than they did here, where I guess they became a much bigger thing here. And I just feel like for every generation, they find something new. And I think it's so much about the music. I mean, it's an incredibly musical band. And, and I think it's, again, as much percussion as anything else. Yeah, I, I think as time goes on, people will start realizing that about the doors, you know, because. You know, at first you think, oh, the Doors, Jim Morrison, it's just like they were on acid and stuff. But, uh, I th you know, the more you uh, listen to those records, uh, the more you, you'll you hear th some uh, music that you might not have thought was there. Well, I think that, that great cover of Crawling Kingsnake, which is, I mean, it was, again, the difference between the British doing blues and the American version where you have Chicago and L.A. and Jacksonville all coming together to create this thing that you can never get in the U.K. Yeah, I, I remember uh, listening to uh, Crawling King Snake at Ray's house with Jim, John Lee Hooker, you know, and saying, oh, someday we got to do this. And this was before we ever had a record deal. And what was the fifth album, sixth album? The last album. Last album, yeah, sixth. We finally got to it. But damn, I mean, you think, you know, Willie Dixon wrote Backdoor Man. <sighs> Jim puts his stamp on things, doesn't he? God. Great. Pipes. Yeah, yeah. please. <laughs> because you write about in Writers on the Storm, listening to it with him for the first time. That, that first time was like listening to that song with him. And it just, that, I just remember that, that chapter, you talk about that. And... Um, were you guys trying to get to it, or did it just take you a while to get to it? I just wondered about that, about the cover of it. Uh, we, we wanted to work on a lot of originals, and we, we, we had written like two albums worth of stuff before we started recording, you know? We had about 30 songs, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we had, uh, I guess, the first, first, second, and part of the third album we yeah. had enough songs for. And then you get to what's called the third album syndrome, where you run out of songs and then you're on the road all the time, so you don't really have time to write any. So you end up writing your third album in the studio. And that's where some bands fail and some don't. And uh, I don't know how we got through that album, but <laughs> I still like it. Because what is it like when you hear L.A. Woman just because of what it represents? Because it being... Uh, the last album. What's it like for you guys to hear that? I love it. <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, you know, we, uh, we went through strings and horns on Soft Parade. We wanted to try Sgt. Pepper, and, and uh, I, I, I dug it. But when we got back to Morrison Hotel and finally L.A. Woman, uh, Bruce Botnick uh, co-produced with our longtime engineer. And I'm thinking about you being a film guy, and I'm thinking about Bruce as a great director, casting Jerry Chef in the role of the bass player, Elvis's bass player. Oh, what a gift, you know, I mean, oh man, talk about a pocket. And so that, that, that's yeah. Bruce. Bruce here? No, he, he emailed, he just got back in town. I told him I was gonna tell this story though.
Go ahead, tell him. No, that's it. I mean, the... <laughs> well, he's just parking the car, so he missed it. But I do feel like, and I said, well, again, I'll say it again, it feels like a very cinematic album to me. It feels like each, each of these songs, in a way, and I was just listening to it all morning to get ready for this, feels like a little movie. I mean, um, and I wonder if you got that sense that it was a bigger project because of the way each of these songs felt that you recorded them. Um, I don't think we purposely set out to do anything, man. We just kind of made the album, and it, and it kind of turned out that way, you know. Uh, but you're right. I, I know what you're saying. I, I think that, you know, I think L.A. Woman was the direction where the band would have gone had Jim not uh, stayed in Paris. Because I just wondered, I mean, if it felt, and because you've been so much struggle, there have been so many fights, and it felt kind of traumatic too, and because we feel some of that pain in some of the songs as well. I mean, it feels it's, like some of the stuff is tough to listen to. And I did want to mention, if anyone's seen the video to L.A. Woman, uh, Ray shot that whole thing and directed it, and that's great. Did you guys... <laughs> didn't you shoot some, uh, some film of your, uh, your first band together? At the ranges, did you like do a little film or something about that? What's that, man? Your first band. Did you guys like shoot a, a little video for Paranoia or something like that? No, but uh, somebody found one of our one of the, so the one song that we recorded, and uh, you can find it on the internet. Actually, did you hear it? Yeah, I heard it. Uh, the, the psychedelic rangers were, we weren't really a band. I mean, well, we we didn't, we never played a gig or anything, right. but. But, but we had a name. Yeah. Hey, John, why don't we get the Psychedelic Rangers back together? <laughs> Just for one gig. One gig. Um, at the time, LSD was legal. <laughs> if, it, if it becomes legal, let's do it. Because if you're looking for a girl uh, bass player, I bet you can find one out here. I just feel like, see, I told you. I just wonder too, when you guys saw this film for the first time, what it was like to watch this, this whole process being worked out again with Bruce and, and seeing Ray and everything? Yeah, what was that like? <laughs> yeah, what was that like, John? I like it very much. I, I you know, we had uh, put out this uh, uh, other doc, one Year Strange, with Johnny Depp narrating, and which I like very much. And this comes along, and damn, it's, it's real good, almost as good as that one. So what I'm do you guys good. think? They're still here, so I think they're okay with it. But I just wonder because... You know, for so many, obviously, this is like a snapshot of your life, or what your life was like when 43 years ago this month you started recording that. And I just wonder if you're watching it, some of these memories start to really flood and because you went through so many different phases on each song of the album. Yeah, it was, uh, it brought back a lot of memories. But, you know, the amazing thing is that, that you know, considering that we really didn't have much footage, <laughs> you know, of that event, that how, how great they, they really put it together and, uh, you know, um, what was the name of the people, uh, Jeff, the director guy? Uh, Eagle, Vision. Eagle Vision, yeah, they did a great job, I thought. Uh, I was real happy with it. And, you know, like recording the album, we were, we were all having fun. Uh, uh, Paul Rothschild, the great Paul Rothschild, taught us how to make records, but he got a little... Um, uh, Dictatorial towards the end. And how so? Well, let's see. How many takes on towards on those? Towards the end? What are you talking about? He was. Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, right, right. We well, didn't call him little, okay. Hit, little Hitler for nothing. <laughs> no, but we needed that because we were, you know, we were very unschooled in, in recording. We knew nothing about what we were doing. So to you refresh know, your memory, uh, Unknown Soldier, we did like about sixty takes on the first half. Remember? Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, huh. So we get to L.A. Woman, and, and Bruce is our pal, and he says, you guys know how to make records. And, you know, Paul used to uh, get me to work on a drum sound for about an hour, and I didn't know about recording, but Bruce said, you know what to do. And in 20 minutes, he has a drum sound. 
And we don't do more than a couple takes on every song. And Jim is yeah. up for... Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's why Jim got used to get really bugged with recording. He'd go get drunk and stuff because right. it just takes so long. Right. Uh, and, and we really uh, had a great, uh, a great time recording that record because we just did it in our rehearsal studio, which we knew, we knew the sound in there yeah. really well. It must have made the difference, didn't it, being in the rehearsal studio for the recording? Right. And we just brought a, a mixing board in there, uh, and um, it was just, it was like uh, kind of recording at home, which uh, a lot of people do today. No, but there's a real intimacy in that, too, that makes it feel, to me, like a real L.A. production. You can sort of hear albums coming after that, that use that, that kind of sound where it feels like it's kind of dense yeah, I mean, and compact. Jim, would, Jim did his vocals in the bathroom, so it was kind of that bathroom echo, you know, it's really nice. And, and I just, uh, the idea of uh, lyrics that write about how L.A. as metaphoric as a woman, you know, cops and cars, the topless bars, never saw a woman so alone. L.A. woman, she's my woman. Yeah, that just kills me. And then there's Mr. Mojo Risen. So correct me if I'm wrong. We record L.A. woman, then he writes down, J-I-M-M-O-R-R-I-S-O-N. Watch this, guys, and starts moving the letters around, and it's an anagram for Mr. Mojo Risen. Genius! Well, you know who claims to have given Jim that idea? Who, Robbie? The witch. I'll leave that alone. <laughs> no, you won't. Uh, what was her name? Uh, uh, Patricia Cornelia. Yeah, that's right. All right, let me just say that... An avowed witch, uh, uh, who Jim was, you know, consorting with a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Pam, in her book, those, I guess those, she For those who book. saw the movie. Pam Curson was Jim's soulmate. Case closed. You can tell the Bruce Botnick story again. Anyway, um, I just thought that each one of those songs being recorded in that space took on a different life for you guys than the other albums did. I just felt like, in some way, though, that was the beginning, like you were saying, of a new chapter. Did it feel like you were exploring new ground just by being in that space that felt so right to record? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, like I say, we were just having fun, you know, for, for the first time in quite a few albums. Uh, you know, recording can be real drudgery uh, sometimes. And... Um, you know, I think I think the joy of, of playing, just playing together, and and uh, not having to slog those songs over and over, because uh, most of the stuff was like two takes, right? Yeah, one or two takes. Um, somehow Jim maintained, <clears throat> you know, he was sort of becoming an alcoholic, but in the studio, he 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 was together, and you remember we played uh, Riders, and in. Dallas, I think, it was the day before the New Orleans gig. And we'd never played it live, and it was cool. And it was sort of like, wow, this maybe this is our new direction, sort of jazz rock or whatever. Uh, the next night, Jim was so loaded, uh, we threw in the towel live. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, because, I mean, just, I mean, that song, that sort of combination of sort of mystique and playfulness of Riders on the Storm starting off from Ghost Riders in the Sky and then coming with that whole other guitar line for I mean it's it, it feels like it was such a, a great experience to just sort of build on something that already existed but add the doors to it was it a great I mean it felt like it's a perfect song to play live just watching it here oh yeah, yeah it was but John's just saying that you know the way Jim was feeling with he had the trial hanging over his head and stuff and um that second night, he, it wasn't just Riders on the Storm, it was the whole show, he was horrible. He was like, he had no, uh, nothing left, you know. Ray described it as seeing Jim's spirit leave his body on stage, remember that? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I know you guys wanted to plan something um, very special, because it is my birthday in a few hours, so. <laughs> Happy birthday to Elvis, yeah. Thank you, guys. I'm 53. So we were 73? thinking... 93? 93. 
to break up all this blah blah, we're going to play a little music for you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, the reunion of the Psychedelic Rangers. First time John and I have played together for like 100 years? 20 years. <laughs> so. <laughs> so we might be a little rusty. Um, hopefully, you guys will sing along with us. That would help. You know, we're not great vocalists or anything, but. Uh, We'll do what we can. People are strange when you're a stranger. Faces look ugly when you're down. Women seem wicked when you're unwanted. Streets are uneven when you're down. When you're strange, no one remembers your name. When you're strange, when you're strange, when you're strange. People are strange when you're a stranger. Places look ugly when you're down. Women seem wicked when you're unwanted. The streets are uneven. Uh, strings from Chef Boyardee. You know, I was thinking about those words, uh, uh, and people are strange. Remember the night that Jim wrote that? Yeah, I do. We were up at our house. Yeah, we were living together, Laurel Canyon, a couple blocks down from the big view of the city. All right. And he uh, came over Georgie to... was up there. That yeah, night. he was kind of depressed, right? Very depressed, very right. depressed. Talking about killing himself and stuff like that, you know, which we, you know, we always took that with a grain of salt, but, but uh, you know, there was obviously something to it. So we kept trying to, you know, trying to make him, you know, see another side of, uh, of how life could be. And this went on all night, and uh, pretty soon the sun was about to come up, 
And so I says, why don't we go up, hey, let's go up to the top of Laurel Canyon and, and check out the sun coming up. You know, maybe that'll yeah. change the mood. So he went up there by himself, though, right? No, no, we went. We all he went, went oh, but, then, but he went over, he, he went up way over on the, on the other side of, of right. uh, Appian Way. And he scribbled down, uh, when you're strange, faces come out of the rain, streets are uneven when you're down. And then he was like happy. Yeah, it was like, yeah. And I realized later that, that maybe, I mean, we didn't have the words for it then, but that's like manic depression, man. That's like uh, ACDC, you know? But I think it the is. important thing is that he channeled that, you know, angst into art. Right, and exactly. And it saved him, and he gave yeah, it to for us. For a while, anyway. Yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we all can relate to that a little bit, you know, when you're down. And so, uh, it's pretty yeah, great. Yeah, but I mean, it just shows, it shows you how he thought, like, you know, when you're strange, people, faces come out of the rain. That it's all how you are inside that you perceive the world. And you know what? I, I remember a friend of mine, when that song came out, this friend of mine that lived up in Frisco, his name was Michael, and this guy was crazy. I mean, crazier than a loon. And he... Uh, and he told me, hey, I really like that song. That is a cool song, you know? And I just saw, I saw how that could relate to, to him because... <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys like that song, then you might be a little... Oh, oh well, I forgot. Shit. Gloves on, man. We're going to do... Um, the lemon chicken. Um, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> That's the bass drum, yeah. Forgot the bass drum. Okay. Good.
Two more. Two more. Don't give it away. Okay, so uh, now we're going to... We're going to... Oh, no request. Uh, we're going to uh, see the virtuoso crab crawling across the strings. Do that intro, you didn't uh, oh, tell me. Right. Oh. You see? Please. Well, my mind is gone. Don't, don't deny yeah. them that beautiful. If you were in the 60s, uh, if you remember it, then you weren't really there. You know? <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, <clears throat> Robbie, aren't you glad we started over? <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> hey, you always get two chances some, sometimes. Oh, man, my thumb. My acupuncturist is here tonight. Let's hear it for Dr. Pan and Dr. Z. They, uh, they, my thumb has been really messed up, and they, they really helped me with my thumb, so that's great. Is that me buzzing? No. I guess it is. Choose now, they croon beneath the moon beside the ancient 
is broken up and dances. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 